All right, welcome to Talking Investing. Uh, I'm Tom, I'm here with Frank Holmes, and I'm gonna give him just a minute to introduce himself. I'm sure everybody already knows who he is, but I'd like to just let him speak for himself. So appreciate you coming on the channel, and can you just give us an introduction? Well, thank you uh, for the opportunity, and uh, I am known for the world of gold. I'm a tax can. I say, y'all come back, eh? Uh, I've spent half of my life in Texas, and I'm a dual citizen, and uh, and I and I love living here in San Antonio, Texas, uh, in the great nation of Texas, uh, and and so I uh, I've been known for the world of gold. I wrote a book on gold. I'm known for the gold funds, and that led me into the creation of the first crypto mining company because originally I was trying to launch a Bitcoin ETF. And I learned quickly that it wasn't going to happen in 2017. Uh, however, when you're a miner, uh, you, you actually create the coin by validating a transaction. So it's a virgin coin. It doesn't have any scar tissue being in, in cyberspace and maybe in a dark pool or something. So there's no AML threat with that. So I became very excited and I love the business model because it really reminded me of uh, Franco Nevada and uh, Wheat and Precious, the gold royalty business, which you have high revenue per employee. So when we launched Hive, is basically three employees. I was just the chairman, not the executive chair in duties today. And it was fascinating because we started off with almost $10 million of revenue per employee, uh, wow. mining Ethereum in, in Iceland. I mean, it was really incredible to see that that's what it gives that leverage. And today we've grown dramatically, much bigger than our footprint then. Uh, and we're still running, uh, probably now with this correction, probably around seven, eight million in revenue per employee. But we were up to almost 15. That's amazing. So you got you talked about, you've got some operations in Iceland and Sweden, I think. And, and it looked to me like those were your GPUs. Is that... Is that right? Or are you guys mining Bitcoin over there? Or are you guys mostly doing Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, that kind of stuff? Well, we're, we're a pragmatist and, um, and and what overall arcing concept. And I'm a fund manager. So it was always to follow what came out of Chicago. The whole advisory was on their research that companies that had the highest cash flow return on invested capital uh, over short periods and long periods of time far outperformed the overall market. So we focused on what are the factors to run this business to have the highest cash flow returns of invested capital. So in Canada, uh, we're in that top 1% of all the Canadian companies. Uh, in the US, it's got to be in the top 10%. So that's how we try to make decisions. And when we, the creation of Hive was being structured, it was to be green only. And it started off in Iceland's geothermal. Uh, and it was mining Ethereum. And then the expansion in Sweden was into Ethereum to become the biggest Ethereum producer. And we've expanded some other smaller areas throughout uh, sourcing hydroelectricity. And we're mining also uh, Bitcoin uh, in addition to mining Ethereum uh, in Sweden. In North America during COVID, uh, we bought an asset in Quebec, uh, just north of Montreal, La Chute. Uh, and that's mining uh, for Bitcoin. And then we did the GPU one transaction a year ago, and that was building uh, 50 megawatts going to 80 megawatts, beautiful, beautiful buildings, campus, right on the border of Maine and New Brunswick. Um, and that's mining uh, Bitcoin. So it looked like to me that that was ramping up right about now up to 75 or 80. Is that, is that going according to plan? Yeah, it is. It's been um, it's been excellent because even though crypto has fallen uh, in this past quarter, uh, our ability to increase our production. So we increased our Ethereum production by 30 percent. So, yes, the difficulty went up, but then we started unloading all those incredible NVIDIA machines, 6,000, 5,000, uh, they're called in, in the 4,000s, and they're highly energy efficient. So you're talking about a huge difference of less less energy and the productivity is 50 percent better than the old amd chips so from that end we were making it when bitcoin was forty thousand. i think we we're doing like 75 cents a kilowatt hour and our cost was a nickel i mean that's the 93 percent gross margins so what happens is that when you're mining with those type of machines and you blend in with the bitcoin 
we have been so far, Anthony Powers does this on Twitter and publishes all the time, we've been the most efficient crypto miner. And in fact, at the end of December, uh, I, we were still the number one in revenue per share growth uh, and bigger than Riot and bigger than Marathon because they did not get their, their machines all uh, up and running. And um, when you look at the cost, I think that it was probably less than $3,000 if you blended our Ethereum and Bitcoin together. So, I mean, that's that's significantly lower. One of the things is I reviewed your financial statements. Uh, you know, some things pop out on the balance sheet and on the income statement. You mentioned one of them. Your gross profit margins in the past have been incredible. Now, obviously, Bitcoin and Ethereum have taken a hit, but... There's all this talk about a bear market and a lot of people talking about crypto winters. So, you know, I don't know and you don't know where things are going from here because we don't know the future. But from a high planning standpoint, you know, what what numbers work for you? Are you still I mean, obviously, you're not a 93 percent gross profit margin anymore, but that's a good place to start. So where does that leave you? Well, if for hodling, we're able to hold all of our Bitcoin um, and. And so with Ethereum coming down, it, it creates more of a stress on that. Uh, anyone can calculate. So uh, we are ranging between 75 and 100 Ethereum a day. It's very volatile. Um, and anyone can go calculate this if they're really into looking at the daily difficulty and our footprint of how many machines we have are, are sort of a petahash. Um, and, and so what we have seen is that in fact, Ethereum's difficulty has come down, which has really benefited us because Ethereum has fallen. And so we're now actually producing more Ethereum. Uh, and, and, and so we've been able to maintain that. And our cost of electricity in Sweden is, is less than three cents. We're hedged. Um, so that gives us a big cushion. Um, you've not been able to get that consistency with other jurisdictions around the world. Um, and, and the same thing is in, I could say, across Canada, I see Washington, it's by county by county. Uh, there's all these inconsistencies, but for Sweden, it's been pretty consistent in, in, in managing that. So we need to have uh, the break even. You know, we have to go and produce uh, $150,000 a day because we only have 20 employees and uh, maintain that capex. So it's, it's really easy to see that if you're producing, I think we said the nine and a half uh, Bitcoin a day. Uh, so you can quickly calculate what's that worth? You know, that's, uh, that, that's 240,000, 230,000 and a hundred Ethereum. So that's another hundred thousand. So you're producing $350,000 and your cost to, to run the business is 150. So we're still, you know, in a, in a positive cash flow perspective, um, but the big thing will be is, is managing the acquisition that with, and the buy of this other equipment and what we've been busy doing in our strategy. Because this is what I've seen in crypto mining, that people are binge buyers. Like uh, all of a sudden they're going to upgrade everything overnight and they have to do a funding, etc. Our process has been going, well, we got older machines, sell them, get rid of them, upgrade with better machines. And that concept I've learned from the frackers in Texas. Uh, friends of mine, uh, 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 private company does 3% of all natural gas. And, and, and if you're not drilling every day, you can't maintain that production profile. And you're always having innovation to be a smarter, better fracking. It can be from the sands you put down, from the bio equipment, chemicals they put down inside to fill in. Um, and so I find it really interesting. That's been our model. So as uh, uh, Bitmain machines are coming in or micro BT machines are coming in this week. Uh, oh, some of these older, older machines we have. Okay. Well, if they're not, if you, they're not fuel efficient, you want to think of energy efficient for our, our standards, sell them, get rid of them and reverse and put in high performing machines. So we do this and it's running like every week. So that's interesting. So you are taking, because obviously as the price of Bitcoin is at the low side at the moment, uh, some of the older machines are not as efficient. You're taking more of an approach of let's get rid of the machines that are less efficient, replace them with new machines versus just the approach of let's just keep growing our hash rate, you know, regardless of the the cost. And so I'm, I'm not sure, you know, you mentioned a lot of a lot of 
ASIC machines have been ordered. So there's there's an awful lot of new companies. You guys are not a new company. There's There's been a lot of splashy headlines, a lot of new companies. And I know there's a few companies like yourself that, you know, maybe haven't been in the headlines uh, because you're taking, a you know, more of a return on investment approach to what you're doing versus a uh, high profile. Here's, here's what happened, you know, that used to be able to two years ago, 18 months ago, buy a machine and you can calculate this that the machine is arrived today it's a six-month payback so then you had to embed in there you're only putting up 50 percent of the money but you're not getting the machine for six months and so therefore you'll still be able to get your money back in a year that's sort of the um and now it's two years so the price of these machines have to come down and and, and that's one reason why we stopped buying uh, any big major new orders this year. We've not bought any major new orders from any of the providers except for we did the Intel transaction because it was so much less expensive and so much more energy efficient, um, those machines. And that's why we did it. And the same thing with the NVIDIA, but we made the NVIDIA transaction last year and all the machines have been coming in and being put into this into our system. Uh, and so, so with that, we, we think that uh, what was at the, the consensus conference on the weekend, uh, uh, it, it was mentioned that there was like $1.8 billion, $1.8 billion of purchases that were only 50% of the money was, was sent, and they still have to come with another $1.8 billion. Now, the capital markets have dried up. Um, lenders are not around um, for like they were, like founder used to be lending, et cetera. All these players have pulled back. Uh, and now this whole crisis, which you've seen in the in, in this sort of metaverse of the crypto space. Uh, and, and I was tickled earlier that you and I remember 87. So most of these viewers here, you know, these kids just don't, they've never experienced this. They don't know what's going on. And, and so whenever you have excessive leverage and there's technology that caused the 87 crisis, it was the first time of using futures derivatives to hedge and they were leveraged hundred to one. And every time the market went down 1%, they would leverage more. And it, kept, it was self-fulfilling destruction. Fortunately, the, the economy was robust. The market got crushed. And even when the stock market market came back uh, because the economy was robust. Now we go to 2000, um, uh, uh, no, 19, sorry, 1997, 98. Uh, we had long-term capital crisis. And that was $100 billion leveraged 100 to 1. So that means a 1% mistake. And all their counterparties all of a sudden get margin calls. And it just starts this contagion that takes place. And uh, and that crisis was started with the Asian crisis, where the J Japan was lending out money short term. And people were building buildings with it. So that the, the, the countries like Thailand and uh, Indonesia couldn't send back a 60 foot building back to Japan. Uh, so they defaulted. And that contagion all of a sudden created the 97 crisis that led into 98. And you could just see it takes four years to repair that crisis. And then we have another credit crisis in 2008, 2009. And that was predominantly housing and the financing mechanisms where I did not know at the time brokers were leveraged 33 to one. That meant a 3% volatility and you're wiped out. And then people were putting down buying houses between one and 5% down payments. So all, that created this huge bubble. We're not going to get that bubble, I don't think, in this slowdown that the, that the Fed is trying to orchestrate. And it's a normal recession where the market falls between nine and 18 months. Uh, people lick their wounds. Uh, but overall, the, the economy comes back and will probably come back with stagflation uh, as the rates fall, is the way, I, the way I look at it. And But the metaverse of the crypto space, now that's totally different. That is like watching a Netflix where they go back for 50 years in time or 200 years in time movies. Uh, and, and so you have people so hungry for yield and you have all these proof of stakers that have allowed these proof of scammers to come in. And all of a sudden, oh, uh, people are taking deposits from innocent people that were promising, you know, yields of eight to 12 percent uh, because it was in crypto land. And, uh, and all of a sudden they're defaulting. And then we have, uh, I think one of these groups got sued for $100 million by the SEC. They had a big fine to pay. 
Uh, they're taking deposits because overall, uh, when rates were at zero, uh, the Fed funds rate basically, and, and during COVID, uh, people were hungry for yield. So who came to that whole, the, the proof of staker model? And, uh, and that's caused its own crisis. Uh, and, and so I don't think it's going to last the normal 400 year study on a, on a global credit crisis, even though this is global. I don't think it's going to take four years. I think the digital space is much faster, but it's going to be licking its wounds for the next year. So, yeah, I mean, all those crises you mentioned, basically in one form or another, were a function of leverage. And, and you know, most recently, although it's been a while now, but, you know, in the 2008, particularly, in, you know, I'm in the U.S., the, the housing market got to the point where, you know, it was... Uh, no income verification loans, 100% loan to value. I mean, uh, no deposits. So that was that was its form of leverage. So, you know, it, each one of these has had its own problem to unwind. So do you feel like, you know, it seems like every time we fit, because we've, you know, we've passed legislation and fixed a lot of that so that that can't happen again. So is it just that the, the people that want to leverage just keep finding a new spot? They find a new way, and that's what's happening. It is unregulated, and and the biggest funders of anti crypto mining uh, proof of work mining are these proof of stakers. Um, and it was that it was rumored that uh, uh, the biggest entity is fighting at the SEC had given five million dollars to Greenpeace to come out and tell Bitcoin miners have to change their code. You know, and and so you get all this fud that's out there. Uh, but the problem is is really in the proof of stake ecosystem, uh, and and uh, and so will Ethereum. Uh, this big push, and I get the hype all the time. Oh, come and stake your coins with us. Stake your Ethereum coins. I said no. I'd rather sell them and buy something else than stake them with you. Oh, we'll give you eight percent, twelve percent. Oh, we got twenty. We refuse to do that. And uh, last year we did made a lot of money for the shareholders holding. Uh, and it took off. It was up much more than Bitcoin. We've been a seller. Um, most of the coins we've sold at higher prices than they are today uh, to buy uh, machines and get down to pay payments to Intel, etc. So I, I think that we're going to get a wake up. And, and by the way, for the Ethereum, I continue every quarter get this since since Hive went public. Every quarter, I get this promising threat or a threatening promise, whichever you want to look at it, that next quarter, a proof of stake is coming to Ethereum and your machines will be worthless. And that's just not true. And that mining has allowed us to be the high, most efficient miner on the planet. And, uh, and I think that what the ecosystem, if they do go to this proof of stake, uh, once again, it's been pushed out from June, now it's gonna be August and then it'll get pushed out again. Um, is that they will hurt their ecosystem because you have over 30 million hobby miners, kids that are gamers, they go to bed, they mine Ethereum, they have wallets, they buy Ethereum, they trade Ethereum. They're all part of price discovery, which is so important to have a robust uh, capital market. And, uh, and so removing all of them to say, oh, we're going to just because we're climate and uh, energy savers uh, is a lot of, to me, BS, because I know that if this whole growth in the metaverse, they need to have our GPU chips that mine Ethereum. They need to have data centers that are independent, like we own and have built. Um, and so I believe that what Hive has done is built beautiful data centers that are great assets on the balance sheet. When we started out at 350,000 a megawatt, they're now for 2 million a megawatt. So I think we've created great value on that balance sheet. And I think we know that these GPU chips we have, have many other avenues to pivot. So we get our money back within a year and uh, we sit on something that has great economic value uh, for sustainable growth. So I'm not threatened by it, but they're very strong with bots on the uh, on Twitter uh, of, of always these proof of stakers uh, pushing this theme. But remember, where have all the proof of scammers come from? Proof of stakers, this whole system. So the regulations really is the SEC wants to come in to regulate proof of stake. And, and they believe that's a proof of security. 
Whereas when you're mining, uh, you're creating a digital asset. So that's definitely, I was a little surprised at some of the, I, I went through as best I could some of the proposed legislation here. And obviously, you know, what's been proposed is probably does not resemble what will end up being passed. Um, and, you know, their initial push was to was not as harsh on proof of stake as I was expecting. So are you expecting that to gravitate more towards, uh, you know, proof of stake equals security? Because I think that's really the big, the big, I, even Ginsler has come out and said, Bitcoin, you know, is not a security at this point. He said, we, you know, in, not but, in so and, many and words. He, I mean, you know why that thought process is along with Ethereum? It's interesting because it's very much like gold and silver mining. Uh, you buy equipment and that equipment basically sep separates the rock that gets grinded down. And then you need to use electricity to heat it up and separate the gold from all the slug. And then you get a gold dory bar. So you need infrastructure equipment and you need electricity. Ah, to make a Bitcoin, you need to have ASIC chips. You need to have a facility to, to uh, do the mining in and you need electricity. You create a digital asset. Same thing with Ethereum. Proof of stake, oh, what do they do with that? Let's just type in our computer some more zeros. Uh, we'll just have the coders that create something new. Well, it's, it's more energy efficient for climate change. Yes, but it also lends itself to more corruption. Uh, and, and so there's the whole issue of, of the tokens that were basically being flogged with pump and dumps uh, as, as securities. There's no corporate governance with them. These are things that I've experienced now as, as coming from the 40 Act business in the US, which is mutual funds and ETFs and investment advisors, that there's a real uh, issue here of, of no corporate governance of any form for these tokens. So yes, they are a security. So do you, you know, last time we talked, you had predicted there would be more delays uh, in moving to proof of stake, and, and that's exactly what happened. So are, are you still in a mindset where you think there's a possibility where this just never happens, or is this inevitable? What's in it? Well, sorry, uh, proof? A switch on Ethereum, a switch to Ethereum proof switch. of stake. Okay. Is, is that now inevitable? Or, you know, I think, and you mentioned earlier, you know, we'll believe it when we see it and we may get more delays. And certainly the series so, of delays well, have been. Right. And so one of the things they're thinking of trying to delay is that every 15 seconds, it's, it's a, a drop puck or jump ball to get a piece to validate a transaction and earn some new coins. So Bitcoin is 10 minutes and Ethereum say 15 seconds and Oh, they want to extend that the mining will only take a minute and a half. And therefore, you'll take away the economics of mining unless Ethereum is $10,000. Uh, they're trying to, that's an easier code of rather than trying to do it 100%. So I think there's going to be a hybrid. That's what I think. And I think that um, uh, if they are actually shrinking and burning all these Ethereum, they keep talking about. Uh, so the supply is actually shrinking. And that will drive it up. But Ethereum has fallen much more than uh, Bitcoin. Ethereum has fallen much more because it's on the backbone of all the proof of stake uh, ecosystem, uh, all this leverage, all this yield. Uh, and, and this was what happened in 2018. Uh, all those token, those other token coins, um, the, the SEC, Clayton came in and went after all of them for pump and dump on those tokens. And you can see they were on the backbone of Ethereum. And as they start to fall, then all of a sudden Ethereum started to fall. Now we have this attack on uh, all these highly leveraged yield uh, tools and it's impacting Ethereum. Um, that's hopefully that all this shrinking there, they keep talking about the less coins that are out there uh, will lend itself that it will have a, an epic sort of rise uh, when we get a bottom taking place. But short term, we are greatly oversold on RSIs. Um, it's greatly oversold. And I prefer you, you what we call standard deviations, looking at 60 trading days uh, versus one year and going back 10 years of data and saying that if you notice that whenever they're down two standard deviations over 60 trading days and over uh, one year of data points, then mathematically, it's a very high probability that over the next 60 days, it will mean revert. And for Ethereum, you know, we're talking about a 30% move, 35% bounce 
uh, per standard deviation. So it could easily jump 70% from these lows. So you could easily be back to 2000. That would only be mean reversion. Um, and so, uh, and what does that mean for Hive? It just means that uh, you know, we, we continue to make a lot of money for the shareholders. I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to say, you know, typically I look at that and, and it's the, we look at the 20 day moving average versus the standard deviations. You guys, it sounds like, look at 60 days. Yeah, 60, 60 days because because we're a public company and, and you've got quarterly financials. Uh, now, if, if you're, um, that's three, that's basically uh, 20 days a month trading. So that's where the 60 comes from. Uh, oh, you're doing you, 60 trading days. I got you. Yep. And if you use and if you use just the futures pro, or the 24-7 the, uh, trading mechanism, then you're using 90 days rolling. And you're using 365 days rolling. So uh, it, it just really helps us to say how stressful is it short term and long term? Is it greatly when it when it's greatly oversold over 20 rolling days, over 60 rolling days and over one year? Uh, the math is so much in your favor for a pop. The 14-day RSI is really helpful uh, for short-term bounces, but we saw recently it was at an all-time low, and then it went sideways, and then it fell again because it basically burned off the 14 days. Right. So if you don't get a bounce back up uh, quickly or when it's down so greatly over 14 days, then uh, you can actually get another leg down. Yeah, that was an unusual little period uh, of just really sideways activity. And you can see, like you said, so when you look at some of this stuff and you feel like we're oversold and underpriced, is that some of the stuff? Because, you know, I'm looking at the 20 day moving average and we have moved into three standard deviation territory. And, you know, that's that's I know there's a million different ways to look at that. And this is just one of them. But and which it, is a great one because it, it helps you to be contrarian mathematically. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett says, uh, here's some of these great stick quotes. And, and one of them is, is life is all about managing expectations. And he said, if you want to have a long lasting marriage, have low expectations. So everything is on the upside. <laughs> but that was sort of the humor. But it was more that in the stock market, you need to have something that can help manage your expectations and the idea of applying a quantitative sentiment tool like you just talked about, it's very, very useful to help you to have the confidence to be contrarian uh, rather than just wake up and say, oh, today I'm contrarian because I re read something. No, mathematically, it's much better. It's like card counting in Vegas. Uh, so I really respect what you're doing when you talk about that. And I agree it is greatly oversold. Um, but I think one of the other parts is that Buffett says that, well, you know, when the tide goes out, you can see who's naked and who's not, and you can see who's pretty and who's not. Uh, and, and I think that that's what we're going to see right now. We're seeing uh, several of the crypto mining companies, and there's lots of uh, uh, hardcore stuff on Michael Saylor with MicroStrategy and how much leverage and margin calls, et cetera. That it's like a gang on him, uh, which is too bad, I think, it's for, but it's what it is. Um, but there are several of the crypto mining companies have borrowed against their Bitcoin inventory. And, and I don't know the covenants, except they've made the press release, et cetera. And, and so they've got to be going through a very, you know, I feel for them because running a business, even for us, you no know, words down, it's stressful. Uh, and making sure people are moving quickly uh, to manage uh, th these sort of crisis moment. But can you imagine now if you have a margin call? Uh, that, uh, oh, I've got, you know, 10,000 Bitcoin, whatever the number is. And, and now I have to put up another 4,000 of my coins against that margin call, or do I have to sell my Bitcoin? Um, so I think from that end, uh, we're going to have to just, you know, just hopefully the Bitcoin mining industry comes out of it. But I will share with you is that the industry has wonderful CEOs. I mean, these are uh, they're all a member organization uh, when I first moved to Texas uh, 31 years ago called YPO, Young Presidents. And when I first uh, went public, we we're like the only YPO, and there's four in the world out of 26,000 of them. And now there's 900. Wow. So uh, Marathon is a YPO. Dave Perel's on our board. He's a YPO, is building everything up for Marathon in Texas. Uh, Jamie uh, from HUD 8, she's a YPO. 
um, the uh, founder of, of uh, Bit Farms. Uh, he's gone off to become uh, like running a fund business, etc. Uh, he's a YPO also. So I, I think from that end, um, we're we're seeing the quality of the executives is another level. And and uh, and I and I and the quality of the boards of directors on these uh, new companies, uh, they just have a higher standard of care and and respect their fiduciary responsibilities than when when Hive first went public because many people copied us, but they were all pump and dumpers. So, do you feel like uh, you know one of the things I've been doing on my channel is I've been doing a running series over the last month. You know what's company by company, you know, how, how are they going to fare in a crypto winter? And I've identified, you know, six or eight key criteria, and you, you would know them better than I do. Uh, and a couple of them are, you know, strength of balance sheet. And, you know, you guys are, you guys are rock solid on that side. So you don't have, you don't have very much debt in your company. So you haven't really leveraged any of your Bitcoin is what it sounds like. You're, you're holding now, I think over 3000. So, and we don't have any infrastructure loans against uh, our chips. So that's, um, and so we, we don't have that. So that's uh, a lot of them have expensive debt that's from eight percent to sixteen percent debt, um, and you can get it. You know, it's just uh, it's dried up recently, where you can go and borrow uh, from these various vendors, uh, and it's a lot of junk bond uh, fund managers that uh, are looking for. Uh, the magic is if you get a 15% coupon, that means you're going to double your money every 4.8 years. So right. a lot of that private equity world drives for, for a 15% CAGR. That's their, their target, their bogey. And a lot of the junk bond players are going for that 15% CAGR. Uh, and so it's recognizing that on the cap table. Uh, and so a lot of our peers have those type of, of, of loans. Uh, and, and I think, you know, they, they've probably been smart enough to be able to manage this um, because, as I said earlier, that the quality of the leadership in the industry is is ex excellent. I'm very proud, you know, when I go into meetings and uh, who my peers are because they're all really good professional fa family people. Um, uh, they're worried about the company. They're worried about the reputation. They're worried about their kids. Uh, and and that's that makes for good uh, uh, what's the word governance? So, you know, these people personally, and obviously, so you can get a little better read. I know a lot of my, my channels heavily skewed towards Bitcoin miners. Uh, so we talk about this stuff all the time. There's, there's an awful lot of fear and people are expecting some carnage in the way of some of these companies not getting to the other end of what's happening right now. So, you know, whether that be two weeks from now or two months or two years, obviously is going to make a difference. But uh, do you see some mergers, acquisitions, failures, or do you feel like the industry is is going to just, you know, make its way through this? And and then and then more importantly, where do you see Hive on that spectrum? Well, when we've looked at M&A work, et cetera, and spoken to people, um, you know, we've not had the uh, um the, the, the confidence that they're green enough uh, for what our vision has been. And then they come back and tell us, well, no one's paying you for your green, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but we're going to stick to our knitting that uh, we do a deal. It's going to be someone that, that is, is, is pretty green and clean. Uh, and, and so we don't have to wake up and deal with that issue. Um, and from that end, that's, that's our thought process. And we think that, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it'll work out longer term for us. So do you guys expect a premium ultimately? And, and again, this is one of those things you don't, who knows when or who knows where, but if the narrative is so strong that this is a climate change, you know, crisis and, you know, we need to be green, you guys are green. So is there going to be a premium put on that at some point in the future? I know you mentioned in one of your recent updates that, you know, you were along with your shareholders. You're you guys are a little frustrated that you're not seeing that premium yet. Well, you see, also is the deal with the bureaucracy, say in Quebec, um, that we take a building of forty thousand square feet, take all the heat from that, and goes over to heat a building two hundred thousand square feet. So we're able to use energy twice uh, in that conversion.
uh, that that's that's super green. I mean, that's just the best you could ever think of, uh, blowing that hot air uh, from the ASIC chips over. And then in Sweden, uh, where the, uh, the the beta site's been done, and it's a smaller facility, but uh, for us is to build a big a greenhouse. And our vision uh, over the next uh, 18 months is to be the the biggest in all of the Nordic countries uh, in in no footprint of bringing cabbage or uh, tomatoes or, or cucumbers from Spain or Italy, we're going to produce them in this big greenhouse where we're blowing all this heat into. Uh, so it's not just using uh, uh, geothermal or hydroelectricity. Like in Sweden, it's 500 yards away. I like to say like, it's like a touchdown pass away how close <laughs> it is to our facility. But to be able to do that and repurpose uh, this heat so all of a sudden feeding people, uh, I'm so excited about that long-term vision. So is that just something that people need to, uh, is it a messaging thing? I mean, or is it just yeah, a, it's a message? Thing? If you're, if you're, if you've got listeners in Quebec, Canada, et cetera, then they've got to pass it on to their politician. You know, that's uh, uh, because in Quebec, it, it, it seems to be, here's something we've noticed is that the more left of center a government as is, then the more draconian were the lockdowns during COVID and the more anti the narrative towards the creep the, the, the crypto ecosystem. And you can see that in Europe with France, you can see it uh, in, in Canada, you can see even in America, you could compare New York City's lockdowns versus Miami. You could compare New York City versus Dallas. Um, big, big differences. Uh, I know that uh, my little girl was in school and was in grade one uh, and in kindergarten the year. She never missed school. It, it was open all the time, but that wasn't open uh, in other places. You know, in New York and, and in Toronto, uh, it was nothing but a severe lockdown. So I, I, I remain, you know, that it, you have to look at the, the, the mindset of the centralist. So the more socialist someone is, then there's a higher probability to be more of a centralist. Bitcoin mining is decentralized. Uh, and so if you look at the discourse between the left and the right, it's really coming down to centralized versus decentralized. I believe that what makes America great as, as a nation is very similar to say someone like Switzerland. Uh, there's lots of power sharing between the states and the federal government. And there's, there's no America like it, Texas uh, uh, attorney general will sue the federal government. It's a non-event. That doesn't happen in Canada. That doesn't happen between the provinces. <laughs> uh, and, and that's not happening in Germany. That's not happening in really in the UK. But it happens in Switzerland. And the cantons have three different languages, the Italian, the French, and their German. Uh, and if they don't all agree, they can't change the constitution. Uh, they've been much more open to crypto mining and most of the crypto foundations are in Zug. So you, you, you just think of, of that idea of a balance of power is, is, not, is a decentralized mechanism and, and then that creates a healthy outcome. Yes, there's more debates and, and, and arguments, but the final decision is much wiser. Uh, and, and that's what I see when I look around the world. It does seem to me like, even in the United States, I'll talk about the U.S. Mm -hmm. and Canada real quick. In the United States, it seems like, although there's a lot of, uh, a, a big, big push to get, particularly the Bitcoin miners to go green, and, and, and they're probably more green than, you know, most other industries right now, even though there's a lot of work left to be done, um, it does also feel it's starting to feel inevitable that, uh, you know, even the legislation that's going to come through that that this is this is here to stay. And, you know, you know, the decentralized portion of this, yes, that we, it needs some regulation and control. But, it, you know, it doesn't seem like an if anymore. It's just a matter of hashing out the details now from I think. At, in the United States, in my opinion. So I don't know as much about the politics in Canada, but in Canada, what I would speak to is it just seems like the climate is so absolute perfect conditions 
to do what you're doing that, you know, is that where some of your efficiencies come from? Uh, Ken is, is, is a great from a weather point of view, um, but I, I would share with you that um, we wanted to diversify because they're all unstable. That's what I find. Like, uh, uh, you don't know earlier this year, the Swedish, some regulator was making some uh, off, off the cuff statements, which were wrong. Um, and then we get uh, Quebec and then I'm told it's been quiet and sneaky in the Brunswick. I really don't know. And then I, it's now it's, it's, it's just all this, this sort of uh, uh, foot around. Um, and, and so the bigger part is, is that we want to make sure that we're globally diversified, that we, we don't have all of our assets, say, in Texas or all of our assets in Sweden uh, or all of our assets in Canada and we're in one province in Canada. And it's more costly, it's more difficult uh, because you have to get your audit in Swedish, you get it in Danish coming in Iceland, you get it out of Quebec in French, uh, you get it out of English in New Brunswick, then you have to get it translated. And then the CFO wants to work all the numbers and get the process done. There's more work doing that, but we think that long-term it was a better diversification. And we do believe like places like New Brunswick uh, that the, the data centers are going to become very valuable. So you mentioned Texas, and you're in Texas. Uh, you've got dual citizenship. Are you guys are you guys looking in Texas, or are you, have well, you made we, any we arrangements? Made, we made the press release that um, of looking at uh, a deal, um, a signed of a letter letter of understanding, um, uh, and so that's that's going through its processes. But we have to be assured that uh, it's going to be uh, on time and be green. Uh, and so that's, we're just going through, we'll make a, a final uh, letter, you know, a, a final firm agreement uh, when we can get these other factors concluded. But staying green and clean is really important to how we want to position ourselves uh, in this ecosystem. Uh, and the other thing is interesting is that um, uh, in some of the institutions like at Wellington, et cetera, and talking to them that we have gold investors that are using Hive as a proxy. And, and our growth at the beginning was that I had this big following from gold and there were reluctant gold buyers to go to these exchanges to buy an open account to buy Bitcoin and Ethereum. So Hive became their proxy. And we correlate 93% of the time by the minute it seems up and down with what Bitcoin prices are doing. Uh, and it's it, for me, I'm really thrilled to see that that some of these gold funds, which I have you know, $100 million in gold stocks, are all of a sudden taking a million dollars worth in high stock. Uh, that's very positive and encouraging. So I'm going to let I want to let you speak to this. Um, you guys did a share consolidation. So obviously that was a big uh, I'm not saying it's a big to do. Uh, the math works out in my mind that it, it, basically it essentially gives you guys the same or similar share numbers to the rest of the your peers. However, uh, I'm sure, as you know, there was a lot of negative, uh, very short term negative talk. Is that dissipating? Is that what's your what would be your response to the to that situation? Well, How would you I address that? I think that um, uh, a lot of that's sort of gone, but um, what we did see was, uh, un I was told was undisclosed shorting. And it's interesting because 25% of our volume in Canada now is short. Uh, it's a huge short position. And the same thing is in the US. Um, and uh, firms like Citadel, uh, one of the brokers said, I don't know how they figure it out, but they're short 500,000 shares. and. Um, and so it, it sort of that pile on because there was a research paper that was written years ago that said every time there's a reverse split that those stocks don't do well. But what they most of that that universe they picked from were pink sheet stocks that have no earnings, have no revenue, have no assets, just a dream, uh, just a story. And, and so when you separated that story, that universe, and you said, okay, only those companies with revenue and cash flow, and they went through this process, how did they do? They did very well. And, and one of the things that we started telling the story was look at Barrick. Uh, Barrick uh, wanted to get listed in New York and they did a big reverse split 
and um, and gold actually fell uh, and their stock went up 30 fold because they were increasing their production and cash flow and discovery. So when bottom, what the real issue is, can you grow your revenue per share and can you grow your production and cash flow per share relative to your peers and relative to the overall market? That's how Mr. Market Quant Funds look at you. Uh, for my other funds, uh, we have this sort of quantum mental approach. And, and, uh, and right now, when you take a look at it, the, the future is still for, for uh, the S&P 500 is a very high multiple for revenue. But for crypto, it's very bearish. Uh, for, so there's, there's basically a discount. And uh, that sentiment has been very strong for the past, like almost nine months of this negative sentiment uh, in, the, in the crypto ecosystem. So I don't know what will change that. All I want to focus on is, can I grow my production? Can I be more efficient? Doesn't matter if, if what's happening now is falling. Guess what? 35% hearing you. 35% of the um, uh, uh, Bitcoin miners were using S9s. Mm -hmm. Their break even was 31,000. What do you think happens right now? You're going to see the big is that a, difficulty falling. Is that is that a number that's recent? Yeah, that's recent. That came out three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I think wow. last month, one of those providers put that data point out. And and so that was really interesting because a lot of the S9s, uh, we sold all ours. They went to Latin America and uh, and that's what, that's what we're told, like Venezuela. Um, and so there's no real cost of electricity, but even where Bitcoin is today, they're losing money. So they're shutting down. And what we've seen this past uh, week is Ethereum's difficulty kept rising, 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 rising. And all of a sudden now it fell. And, and so what happened when China kicked everyone out was the difficulty crashed and we got more coins. So actually, even though Bitcoin fell, the, the number increase of our Bitcoin production every day, we were ahead. And, and so we're almost at that inflection point. We think in the next week, we're going to see this with Ethereum and Bitcoin, that, that a lot of people are going to stop mining both of those. And all of a sudden, we are going to get more coins, which will offset the decrease in the price. So, you know, touch wood, let's hope that that's what's going to prevail. Uh, I can't guarantee it, but it appears that way talking to our chief technology officer this morning on our morning call. Okay, so essentially you're you're expecting, even though there's so many open purchase orders in the short term anyway, you're, you're thinking the difficulty level is going to decrease. Correct. But I don't think these guys can go and get lending without paying 20%, 18% cost of capital or massive dilution uh, to be able to uh, pr purchase their other machines. So that means that production that was forecasted to grow for Bitcoin at 3% a month is not going to happen. Okay. I mean, are those companies just going to delay? Are they going to lose their machines? I'm mean, Obviously, you don't, you can't give a broad I, answer I don't to know, that. Uh, I don't know those agreements. I know we don't have uh, anything with Bitmain or uh, uh, MicroBT. Uh, any big uh, uh, commitments. Uh, the only commitment we have now is with Intel. So yeah, I just want to talk about that for just a second. You, you've you shifted to buying the chip, the ASIC chip from Intel, and I think you're sourcing, building the machine around it. So is that, where are you guys in that process? And, you know, it, it looks from your press releases that the philosophy is you're selling your Ethereum and you're increasing your Bitcoin mining yeah. footprint. Is that is that yes. accurate? It's accurate. And, and, and also it has a higher margin business um, uh, for us. Uh, and so it allows us to branch out and then we'll be able to use those chips, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And, and you've seen this, uh, I thought it was a smart move with uh, HUD-8. You know, they bought a data center business uh, and, and that's where you, you needed to do that. Um, to get those high performance computing chips because when they first bought their uh, Nvidia chips, they can only mine with those. The chips that we bought, they multi multi uh, uh, skill sets. They can be used for rendering, they can use for gaming, they can use for artificial intelligence, 
they were not they were not just for mining ethereum so our game plan was to mine ethereum uh and you can do two coins at a time if you want on these things they're incredible uh, and and then uh be able to build out this high performance computing because i believe that we're going to see that these independent data centers are going to become more and more valuable uh for the crypto ecosystem to build out so ultimately however long it takes is the final destination for these gpus uh high performance data center yes so that's that's the plan so and, you're gonna and and, and the big growth now is, is smart cities uh there's conferences all over explaining how you use ai and you upload uh put cameras on every lamppost in, in downtown core and uh, with facial recognition software you can see if any any criminal on the wanted list uh, walks down the street uh, you can see any car that's been stolen, their license plate or reads those. So the police don't have to be at every corner. They know where to go. And, and then you have people feeling safer. Um, this has gone on for a long time before the digital world in Monaco. And then, and so now they've, they've advanced their technology. And this was done by the guys that, from Machine Zone that created the incredible gaming business that does $6 billion in revenue. They did it for a city in New Zealand. So they need our chips. They need those chips that can, can you can upload the data, apply AI, do facial recognition, and then tell the police, bad guy, bad car, stolen car, going up highway I-10, go. And, and they know exactly where to go get them. So for you guys, is it that you'll sell those chips or is that that you'll create the data center and, and, and run and you know outsource those programming? both if we can't make money you know with them and do it then we'd sell them you know and uh we've got our money back okay well that makes sense um for just to finalize on the share consolidation um you know when i look at it the your stock price has basically mirrored most of the industry uh, we know that unfortunately the miners at the moment have but I, I mean, let me let me sort of interject for a second. But what I forgot with the thought process is that Citigroup did it after the crisis of 0809. Uh, AIG did it after the crisis of 0809. These are real solid businesses. Uh, GE did it, uh, and so it is. When 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 a company is going through an industry crisis and they come out of it okay, it's it's smarter to have a higher price stock. We were told that if you're not over five dollars you're not going to be marginable in the us and you're not going to be able to go on a lot of lists to be recommended uh and institutions some of them have in their prospectus a document they can't buy stocks under five dollars so we're not under five dollars now but that was the thought process when we first started so it was a bigger audience of buyers but two was was that if you're under two dollars for long and if you go under one dollar you're going to get kicked off nasdaq Right. And and so you want to be thinking a bigger audience of investors at the same time and, uh, and that you don't want to be all of a sudden get a letter and didn't want to make a press release. You know, NASDAQ has told us we have to consolidate. Uh, that's that's a real negative narrative. Uh, and so I thought we were trying to be thought leaders and be ahead of that curve uh, for two reasons. And actually, looking back now, I'm really happy we did it because we would be in difficulty being on NASDAQ because uh, a stock could be under a dollar. Right, under the same trajectory. So do you guys feel like, cause one of the things is, you know, if you don't if you don't need to raise equity capital, you know, then, then that problem, whatever short-term effect it has on your stock price is kind of not, not relevant. You've, you know, your track record as a company is going to dictate your stock performance over time. So are you guys, do you guys need to go, are you seeing a scenario where you think you need to start drawing down uh, equity or, you know? Well, you know, one of the things is, it's, um, uh, we, we, don't, we don't need it right now if, if we uh, just basically go on our, our growth plans that we're doing. Uh, but I think that what we would like to have is to be able to, uh, after we get our financials out, to have an ATM on side. Because I think that when Bitcoin will reverse, there will be meme reversion. And, and uh, there's a huge short position on Hive uh, and it will just gap. 
Uh, we saw Memorial Day, uh, Canada was open, U.S. was closed. We jumped 17 percent. Uh, next day it opens and all of a sudden the shorting comes in of the U.S. It was remarkable. So, I, I tracked so, the, There's four or five on both exchanges, so it was really easy to compare. It was a shocking, shocking difference. So that's just the, you know, that negative sentiment. So I think it will reverse. Uh, and if you have a tighter float, which we have, uh, I, I think that you could just get these big epic moves uh, and then not only try bouncing with Bitcoin Ethereum surge will be then short covering. And um, and so I, I, it'll it's just a matter of time uh, before something like that can easily happen. So with that, if the ATM is inside and, it, and I've always said when we did our ATM before, you know, we only raised money in up days and we didn't use it all. We let it expire because our discipline was only on an up day and only a small piece of it. And, uh, and I think that the average price that if we, we raise money at is probably like $20 a share. Wow. Yeah. You so know, that- so that's, it's, that's why we, 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 it's been most accretive when people make these statements that, Oh, it's so dilutive. Well, it's just not true because if it's dilutive, we wouldn't have the highest cash flow returns on invested capital. <laughs> we would be lower. And it's just math that calculates that. So how many machines you have, it's like a gold mining stock. What's your reserves per share? What's your revenue per share? What's your cash flow per share? Uh, we now have gold fields merging with Yamana. Well, gold field gets tanked. Why? Because when you merge them together, you're going to see that the reserves per share are actually less. The revenue per share is less. Oh, but the top line is bigger. It doesn't matter in the quant world. It's on a per share metric. So I have been very focused on protecting the metrics on a per share basis. So if I raise capital, then I then I went and bought a machine that was going to give me the six month return on my capital, not two years. Uh, and, and that mechanism, so that allowed me to generate those high cash flow returns on invested capital. So I just, you've given me a lot of time. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I just hope I haven't confused you uh, on all this <laughs> stuff, but it's, it's like an institutional presentation. No, it, it's an awful lot of information and I have a lot of other questions left on my list, but I know you've already given me a lot of time. So I just want to ask you one more, just to, I guess, a twofold question to the to the shareholders in Hive and and to the naysayers, um, you know, can you just wrap up? What's your, where do you see you guys a year from now? Well, it's like a gold stock. You know, it'll, you have to make a forecast on what you think Bitcoin can do in the next year. Um, I, I think that it still has smaller probability of more downdraft um, and it has a higher probability uh, of being higher. I think this time next year, it'll probably be more like $40,000 back at that level. Uh, the difficulty uh, will not be as forecasted. I don't think it's gonna grow at 5% a month as some people forecasted. It might be at 2%. So if you can bring on, on really high uh, energy efficient machines, uh, then uh, I think that you're going to be able to make a lot of money for the shareholders. And that's our vision for it. I think Ethereum uh, can be back at uh, twenty five hundred uh, to thirty thousand dollars an Ethereum uh, in a year from now, <laughs> and that means you're just bounced from the lows uh, over a two year period. You're still you're still below the highs, so it doesn't mean it's gone to hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. But I think this the stress is mean reversion is a very powerful tool, and uh, once we get cleaned up with all these. Uh, proof of stake uh, lending schemes of for yield uh, get behind us, then I think uh, we'll see the system start to ratchet back up again. And only the strong will survive. Those with less leverage, uh, those are fleet of foot. Uh, we'd be able to uh, prosper in this ecosystem. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks for the information. I do have a bunch more questions, so maybe we can get you on in another couple of months and and see if that uh, you know, we I, can I transfer. Forgot, <laughs> I forgot ahead. to share with you, like Core Scientific, I think they have three YPOs in, in their entity. Uh, and, and so this is a good industry. This is this has a lot of uh, very high power driven 
uh, successful uh, executives in all these different entities. Um, but uh, it, this means to me that this industry has a longer cycle. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to thank you very much for joining us on the channel and uh, go Hive. <laughs> thank you. From your lips to God's ears, up Bitcoin, <laughs> up Ethereum. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Okay. Bye.